Good evening and welcome to Creatives Month here at the Broadcast Network. And what better way to kick off this new topic than a live broadcast with the lovely Johnny Meller. More about him in a second. Already I can see that we've got folk listening live, so a special welcome to you. Um, just an outline of how this next hour should pan out so you know what to expect. The next 30 minutes will be over to Johnny, who, are going to be, who is going to be tackling the question of why should churches care about the arts? Following which, I will put your questions to Johnny. So don't wait while he's typing, while he's talking. Um, anything comes to you, anything that he said, anything you would like to know more about or questions of your own, then please type away in the Q&A box and I will be able to put these to him, which will be the second part of tonight. That's the second half an hour. Okay, so, oh, what can I tell you about this dude with the big hair? He is a rapper and a church leader at Christ Central in Birmingham, but he also heads up Sputnik Community Artists, which is linked to the Catalyst Network, part of New Frontiers family. So off the back of that intro, Johnny, please take the stage. This half an hour is over to you. Hello. I'm on. Fantastic. Uh, great stuff. Thank you, Hannah. Um, yes, I am Johnny. Uh, my hair is not as big now as it is known to be. I've had a haircut, uh, so apologies for that. Um, yeah, if I'd known, I would not have had a haircut again. Um, but then, um, yes, yeah, so where, where do I start? Yes, I'm an elder at Church Central in Birmingham, a New Frontiers Church. I also, as Hannah said, lead a network of Christian artists called Sputnik. Um, and by artists, as I'm going to go and say later, I mean artists of all disciplines, um, not just kind of painters, which often... Uh, people would think of when I speak of artists. Now, what, the question I want to uh, bring to us and kind of hopefully provoke and throw around a little uh, is why should the church care about the arts? And what I'd like to do is just break down that question uh, really and uh, pull out three things and define them within that question. First of all, I'd like to spend some time on the word why. Why should the church care about the arts? Why, is, why should the arts be important to a, a Christian at all? Uh, then I'd like to focus on maybe that term, the arts, which even so far I've managed to dissect a little bit of what artists and what the arts mean uh, and something like that. Um, I, I'd like there are loads of different ways to view the arts. Is it just creativity? Is it something else? What kind of art um, should we as Christians uh, find uh, put our time and effort and even money into what, what kind of art is most important. So I want to focus on defining the arts a little. And then finally, I'd like to hone in on the phrase care about. Why should we care about the arts? Well, practically, what does caring about the arts uh, mean? What does it look like uh, for us as Christians, whether you're an artist, whether you're not an artist, whether you're a church leader or not? OK, and then it's over to you with questions. I think, you know, the drill. OK, so let's start with the why then. Why should we care uh, about the arts? Now, um, just as, as I mentioned a minute ago, that I, I've already said it and I'll say it again, the arts, just phrase uh, terminology, I will use the phrases the arts, art and artists as we go through. And I'm meaning by that uh, anyone involved in an artistic discipline of any sort. So it's not just painters and artists in, in the terminology I'm using is it would not be a painter, it could be a writer, a dancer, a sculptor, a musician and things like that. Uh, some might use the word creatives. And I may use that every now and again. I don't like the term creatives. And uh, if you think, oh, that's a pedantic start to things, well, you'll have to hold on because I will explain why that is a little bit later. OK, but just to just to get the terms straight. So why should we care about the arts uh, then? Well, uh, I think in short, um, I, I guess speaking for me, why I care about the arts, uh, I care about the arts because uh, of their communicative power, I think. Uh, there's many ways you could define the arts or bring some definition. I don't think any of them is is sufficient and, and sum up fully what is art. But one way to think of art is as a super form of communication. And um, in that sense, even just with a very simple uh, definition like that, as people who are Christians who have something pretty important to communicate, I think we should cherish the arts as this very, very unique and special form of communication. Um, and we should cherish those who practice their artistic disciplines in a way that powerfully communicates. So um, if we can say that as a starter, maybe, as, as the why. 
Now, I think this could be, I could point you to kind of sociology and culture and how the arts interact with culture or my own experience. Uh, but time is short and probably this is probably the right way to start anyway. I, I'd instead like to point you towards uh, the Bible, if that's OK. Now, um, there may be some specific parts of the Bible that come up as this um, this uh, seminar goes on. Uh, however, I'd just simply like to point to the whole thing. OK, for a second, think about the whole Bible. OK, what is the Bible? I know this. <laughs> basic question um, but bear with me it'll probably all become clear uh, in a second what's the bible well the bible is i guess we know would be uh, a library of 66 books uh, written in all sorts of uh, different styles there'd be some bits that would be histories there would be some personal correspondences some letters there'd be some list of laws which would be the bit that in your yearly reading plan most people aren't particularly keen on um, but there's all sorts of different styles of writing but it's got to be said that within that a large portion of the Bible itself is actually art. Now think about that for a second. I'm not saying it's about art or it's about artists, although many bits of the Bible are. It is itself art. The uh, English professor Leland Riken, he writes this. He writes, whole books of the Bible are poetic. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon. A majority of Old Testament prophecy is poetic in form. Jesus is one of the most famous poets of the world. Beyond these predominantly poetic parts of the Bible, figurative language appears throughout the Bible. And whenever it does, it requires the same type of analysis given to poetry. Riken uh, was asked then on the back of this how much of the Bible he thought was poetry. And he put the figure as a third. He thinks the third of uh, the Christian scriptures is written in poetic form. OK. I want you to think about that for, for a second, because I think that's remarkable. Let's think about the, the Bible from God's perspective. What's God doing in the Bible? Well, God is in a situation where he cares deeply about humanity. OK, he loves humanity and he wants to communicate with humanity. He's not just staying off on a cloud somewhere. We're not some uh, experiment that he's interested in that way. No, he cares about. It, so he wants to communicate. And he communicates to us through this uh, library of books. Um, but the issue with the communication, the difficulty for God, if you could put it like that, is there is a gulf between humanity and God, isn't there? Um, for all sorts of different reasons, um, you could say we don't speak God's language. It would be one, one thing uh, to say. Uh, but also, not, not just that, there's a hostility in us naturally as humans and a resistance to what God's got to say. So God wants to communicate, but there's this gulf between humanity and God. So what does God do? Well, he gives us a Bible, a third of which is written in an artistic form. OK, I think that should be a, an indicator straight away of like, wait a minute, we should flag this up. We should maybe look to learn from the ultimate not just artist, but the ultimate being and our, our creator, our father, our Lord, you know. Because I'm sure it won't be too much of a jump to see how our situation is very similar to God's situation. As his children, we've got a similar role. We want to communicate stuff to people. There are people we feel dearly about, like individuals, but also whole whole cultures uh, of people. But we recognise there's a gulf between us and them and that they don't really want to hear what we want to communicate. And therefore, I think it would be worth taking a leaf out of God's book in our forms of communication. God, when that happens, communicates artistically. At least a third of the things he says uh, would be artistic. I think we also then need to uh, engage with artistic practice and make it a priority to be able to understand at the very least, but also push forward practitioners who would uh, be able to practice the arts in a way that communicates powerfully. OK, so there's the why. Let's move on to a different phrase that I use in the phrase. Why should we care about the arts? Well, the arts, then let's think about that. Do I just mean then why should we care about creativity? Um, the arts could obviously be referring to all sorts of things, or art could be referring to all sorts of different, there are different types of art, there are different styles of art, uh, or as I said, just creative stuff in general. Now, I mentioned at the beginning my uh, slightly pedantic dislike of the term creative for artists. Um, and the reason for that is that by calling artists creatives, what we're essentially implying that what art is, is creativity. The two things equal each other. They are the same. OK. And then an artist, therefore, is a creative. There's nothing more to it uh, than that. So in, in that sort of way. Now, of course, creativity is very important. Uh, in in art that's that's obvious and and i'm not gonna not gonna say that's not the case it is, it is the case um and on top also we've got to say um 
that artists would be creative people usually. And by creative people, I mean people who are open to new ideas, innovators, outside the box thinkers, uh, stuff like that. However, I would argue that actually creativity, while it's important within art, it's definitely a feature of art and it's a feature for artists, would be a reasonably small feature in some ways of artistic practice and uh, of an artistic, uh, for an artist of things that are important to, to artists in many ways. Now, I think uh, the problem becomes if we just see art as creativity, we then start trying to fix a problem that maybe doesn't even need fixing. Because I, I'd argue that as regards creativity, um, first of all, everyone agrees creativity is a good idea. It's very rare to come across someone who says, no, creativity is bad. Everyone likes creativity. And actually, in our churches, I think we're doing pretty well on creativity. But some people would say things like, "We, I wish our church was more creative. Uh, I mean, I think that's a hard um, hard thing to ask our churches to be much more creative. Let's take a let's take a given Sunday at an evangelical charismatic church in the UK. OK, on that Sunday, you are likely to find uh, corporate singing, obviously, for a large, large portion of the meeting. And during that time, you may well also have dancing. OK, and some of that kind of contemporary dance as well that people do on their own uh, or maybe together with others. There could be banners uh, in the meeting waved or flags. Uh, obviously, the, the meeting hall itself might be uh, decorated in some sort of form. And then, of course, within the whole mix of that, you would have spontaneous contributions of uh, of songs and in, in some places poems and increasingly in some places paintings on the stage. I mean, there's not many situations that you get yourself into in, in culture now where people just start spontaneously make up a song and sing it out in public. That's that's pretty Woodstock when it comes to creativity. I mean, we're, we're really on the fringes here. Um, now, obviously, that stuff can be done well and that stuff can be done badly and uh, and that stuff can be helpful and it can be less than helpful. And I don't think we should do anything without thinking it through. Um, but in this sense, all I'd say here is I think we're doing pretty well regarding creativity uh, and creative self-expression in our churches. Where, where I found that the churches I've been connected to are lacking in this area is actually not in the, in the form of creativity itself. It's in an understanding of the other ingredients that turn creative expression into powerful artwork. And I want to suggest uh, three of those, you really quickly hit them and you can pick them up in, in the questions, okay? Powerful art that communicates uh, would be about craftsmanship. It's about creativity, but not just about creativity, it's also about craftsmanship. Art that's any good, if I can use a phrase as base as that, um, does not tend to come from a moment's inspiration or uh, even half an hour's prayer time. Uh, art that's any good would come from hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and probably more hours of hard work to learn and perfect your craft okay and that training and that learning could be professional um art college a conservatoire for musicians or a master's in creative writing or something like that or but it doesn't need to be professional i'll give you an example uh, i have a friend called hugh and hugh is a poet and he enjoyed dabbling in poet poetry as a young man OK, um, uh, and he I'm sure if I read his poetry as a young man, his young his poetry started off with, I probably thought it was very good. But for him, he knew about poetry. and He thought my work is OK, but it's not setting the world on fire. I want to become better as a poet. So what am I going to do? And so what he thought was I would, I am going to do more poetry. How am I going to become better at doing something? You do more of it which is an incredibly profound insight, although it sounds very simple. <laughs> if you want to be good at something, you just do more of it, okay? Uh, but he had a few obstacles to, to this quite simple plan. Uh, one of them was his full-time job. He had a full, different full-time job. Uh, and four of them were his young children, okay, that he had at the time. He obviously wouldn't describe them as obstacles or anything, uh, but I'm, I'm putting words into his mouth here. But they would certainly have taken time away from being able to learn his craft in that way. So he thought, well, what am I going to do? I need to start somewhere. So what he did was he said every Saturday from 11 o'clock to one o'clock, uh, 11 in the morning to one in the afternoon, he, he would lock himself in his study, uh, blank piece of paper on the, uh, on the table and a pen. And he would discipline himself to give you two hours to writing poetry every Saturday. OK, and he did this for a number of years. Uh, his life situation after a while changed. And uh, he then went on to do a creative master's, uh, master's in creative uh, writing. OK, uh, Hugh is now in his 50s. Uh, he'll be releasing his first collection of poetry at the Catalyst Festival uh, this year. Called Minor Monuments, big plug. It'd be great to uh, support Hugh in that. And it's great to support him not just because he's my mate or he's one of the gang because he's in our churches. He is an exceptional poet. Uh, he really is. And you'd find that if you 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 
uh, read, read his work, okay? But he didn't become an exceptional poet from a moment's inspiration of a creative impulse. He came, he came to that place through uh, cr cr learning his craft, okay? Through developing a, a skill uh, in that sort of way. An artist isn't someone who likes creative things, at least an artist who's gonna powerfully communicate to people. Uh, they're not even someone who does creative things. An artist is someone who has got good at doing creative things in their art form, and that uh, spends a lot of, that's from time spent on that sort of thing. So, powerful communicative art is about craftsmanship. Secondly, powerfully communicative art is about entering into a tradition, okay? To be good at something means putting in the hours, but it also involves entering into a whole tradition and culture, okay? Now, what I mean by this is that effective artists are not just those, actually, even who just learn to understand the rules of the tradition they work in, okay, whatever it might be in their artistic discipline, but they're those who have lived in those things so long that they're fluent in their practices and even then move on to then start shaping the rules of the traditions they work in uh, themselves, okay? And the way we see this most, if we're not artists, and we, this might confuse us in pieces of art, actually, is that most artists working at a very high level will put little winks in their work, if I could put it like that, towards other great artists in their traditions to kind of say, look, I've entered, I know what I'm doing, okay? I'll give you a very concrete example. Uh, take Star Wars, okay? Uh, two of the main characters in Star Wars who've been, I think, in every single Star Wars film, they might be the only characters in every single one, I'm not, I'm not sure, but they've definitely been in, been in every single one, would be C-3PO and R2-D2 who are two robots. They don't have a whole lot to say. In fact, R2-D2 doesn't say anything, he bleeps, okay? But they would be very, very well-developed characters in the Star Wars universe. They, they, they would be characters etched on the consciousness of, of at least the Western world, probably the whole world, okay, in that way. Now, um, it might be interesting to you to find out, though, that uh, C-3PO and R2-D2 didn't really, their first appearance was not, in some senses, in the, in the 1977 film Star Wars New Hope. Actually, their debut, in a way, was about 20 years before that in Akira Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress, okay? Now, uh, who, who am I referring to? Well, Akira, Akira Kurosawa is a, a renowned um, uh, Japanese film director. And in his film Hidden Fortress from 1958, uh, the film focuses on two bickering peasants who get caught up in a huge war and wind up joining forces with a general and a princess and they fight to destroy a fortress okay anyone who sees star wars i'm sure you can find more similarities there than just just these guys but the thing i want to hone in on is uh, c-3po and r2d2 were based upon the bickering peasants in hidden fortress okay now why why did george lucas choose to take characters from another film and put them in his film or at least embellish uh, build his characters on them was it because he'd run out of ideas? Was it because he was lazy? Was it because he was a plagiarist, okay? No, not at all. What Lucas was doing was he was giving an almighty wink to those in the know, the geeks in his genre, to say, I've entered into this tradition. I know what I'm doing. And for us as the audience who don't know Akira Kurosawa, okay, what he's doing is he's building layers to his characters. He's standing on the shoulders of giants in what he's producing, which is one of the reasons why those characters uh, are so uh, are so well developed, are so such good characters, okay. And you'll see very similar things in in, in most uh, art forms uh, and, and artists working at a high level in different art forms. Interestingly, you find a very similar thing uh, in the Bible uh, as well. And in, it's in one of the specific uh, art forms in the Bible, which is the art form of proverb writing. OK, proverbs, these are um, sometimes witty, but kind of pithy little sayings of wisdom. Uh, they're so important in the Bible, they get their own book. They get the book of Proverbs uh, named after them. The key guy in writing proverbs uh, would be King Solomon. And I'm sure this is no surprise uh, to any of you, those listening, I'm sure you've read the proverbs and you've uh, more than read them, you memorized them, all of that sort of stuff. But here's a question with the proverbs. Where did he get the proverbs from? I don't know if you ever thought of this before. Where did King Solomon get these ideas from for these proverbs? Now, uh, the Sunday school answer, which would not be a million miles from the truth, would be God gave them to him. 
And of course, Solomon had a dream uh, in which God said, ask me anything you want. And he said, I want wisdom. I need wisdom to be a king of the people. And God said, yeah, fine. I will give you wisdom. So there's a gift of wisdom given to him from God. That's true. That is definitely what happened. However, if we see that as then God then saying, like downloading the problem to Solomon's brain so that he's like, God, uh, help me. And he writes on the page, blah, 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 blah. I'm just downloading the information. I'm reciting what God said. We, we've missed the point of what's going on there. Because actually Solomon, while he was inspired by God in the in the Proverbs, uh, uh, would be definitely my, my belief on that thing. He had a, a far more earthy source of inspiration for his Proverbs. Scholars would be pretty unanimous in seeing a very strong link between Solomon's Proverbs and the other examples of the genres of Proverbs, of the genre of proverb uh, writing uh, in the Near Eastern world at that time from Mesopotamia and Egypt, particularly in the instruction of Amenemope, uh, which is an Egyptian pro uh, wisdom book that in some cases Solomon quotes from, at least for structures of some, some of his passages. Again, let's, let's consider this. To create this amazing type of literature that we find in the, the Bible, which, I mean, it's it's kind of poetic, but it's certainly crafted in a way that's above prose uh, in kind of artistic style. OK, to craft this, what Solomon did was he entered into an artistic tradition. He did his homework. He stepped in. And he studied Mesopotamian Egyptian proverb writing. And the way he writes it is clear. He not just understood it. He had a respect for those disciplines as well from people who actually Israel were traditionally not that keen on uh, at that time. Well, it was on my notes. Here we go. That's 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 good. So we see, no, I'm back. Um, so we see that in the Bible. Now, thinking of all that, what I think is a painful realization for us as Christians, we've got to come to terms with. In the evangelical church in modern times, I think we have done the complete opposite of this uh, in our artistic output a lot of the time. What we are uh, known for, our reputation would be among Christians and those outside the church, I think many would see this, would be that we actually pillage different artistic traditions uh, and take kind of the surface stuff while showing very little respect for those traditions themselves. And in many cases, actively criticizing them while we pillage them. So, for example, in, in contemporary worship music, every now and again, we might reach for a, a rock riff uh, or uh, even put a rap halfway through. Uh, but at the same time, even in the same meetings, we might do that. It might well be that we are very critical of those genres or the cultures that produce them. OK, now I, I'm not saying there's there's nothing to criticize within artistic disciplines. Okay, I'm not saying they're above reproach in that sort of way, but I think we're pretty like that. I hope you could see that's problematic as, as a way of doing things okay there will be many people who are not in our churches and some who be quite hostile to the christian faith primarily or at least largely because of this exact thing because you've got to understand with with artists and with people who are deeply into the arts they cherish those traditions they, they those traditions are very important to them and if they see people taking them lightly and actually maybe using them for their own purposes without showing the due respect okay um that's really off-putting and seen as a disrespectful. And, and if we want to win those people back to our churches, we need to show, I think, more respect for the artistic traditions that are out there and at least be much slower to criticise things we don't understand uh, or the things that we're not into. Um, and that's one thing, but that's just the start. We need to go further. We need to encourage, I think, our artists uh, to wholeheartedly enter into those traditions giving them time and effort and become real geeks in those traditions and then also pass them, those in church leadership, pass them as they do that. OK, and that's really important. So art is about craftsmanship. Art's about uh, entering into a tradition. Art that powerfully communicates is also usually about raising questions rather than giving answers. OK, art, powerful art is about raising questions rather than giving answers. I have a friend who's an artist. Uh, funnily enough, um, as in the visual form, he's a, he's a kind of painter and conceptual artist, I, I suppose. And I talked to his church leader a while ago, a guy who I don't know, um, but I had a conversation with him. And his my friend, uh, this church leader was very complimentary about my friend, um, and said loads of nice things, and loads of nice things about his art as well. And he said it's so great to have uh, an artist in the church. And then he said it's so great, I want to invite him to put on an exhibition at our church building. Well, I was interested. I said, OK, great, fantastic. Uh, what kind of thing did you have in mind? And he said, look, I've, I've not got it all worked out, but I've got a basic plan. Basically, what I'd like to happen is this. I'd like him to create an exhibition 
that basically mean, would mean that if someone came into that exhibition with almost no knowledge of Christianity, OK, they would leave the exhibition understanding the whole gospel. OK. Now, I'd like to reflect on that. I, I don't know the people who I'm, I'm talking to. I can't even see your responses to that. But I'll ask you, do you think that would be a good use, use uh, of an artist uh, in your church? Do you think that an artist, if you ask someone to do that, they would be honoured uh, by that kind of request? Do you think such an exhibition would be effective even? Now, I think if we can discuss that a little bit, bit later, I'm sure there would be an effectiveness to an exhibition if done in the right way, potentially. But in a sense, even that idea shows a profound misunderstanding of art practice. There's, there's some creative people who are involved uh, clearly in creating art that delivers answers in a very prescribed way like that, that kind of downloads information into your brain. Um, but they wouldn't often be called, well, the, what they do isn't often called art, it's called advertising. Uh, if we push that slightly further, it's got another name, it's called propaganda. That's what those, that sort of practice it call, is called. And that stuff has an effect, an immediate effect, but actually most people are really wary of that nowadays, and, and rightly so. It's about slogans, it's, a, it's about just delivering this and often the slogans the advertising the propaganda has nothing behind it and so why when people see christian propaganda and advertising would they think there's any depth to it in that sort of way no powerful art doesn't just simply put it all on a plate for you like that what it does is it draws you in it even offends you a little it shocks you as well as enticing you back in again it kind of defies your expectations uh in those sort of ways but also warms you to it it's raising questions, it's starting a conversation, uh, not just giving you uh, answers on a plate. And again, in God's word, we, we see this very clearly, uh, I think. And we see that this is, God understands this quite clearly, not just because uh, in the Old Testament, we see a number of characters that operate in this sort of way, uh, most notably the Old Testament prophets, and most notably them, Ezekiel, okay? Often there's these strange performances that would be very opaque to the people who came by that are meant to draw them into a conversation. God says to him in Ezekiel 12, did they not come to you and say, what are you doing? That's the point. The question is the point. Uh, so that happens. But even more so, when God comes to earth himself, this is exactly how he, God, the creator of everything, the all wise one, communicates with people. Obviously, uh, for Jesus, that would be mainly in, in the form of parables, OK, stories with a meaning. And those stories with a meaning, we, we often, I think, think, oh, we've got these parables now. We know exactly what they are. They're very simple, aren't they? But they're not simple. I mean, the parable of the dishonest manager, OK, <laughs> or individual bits like, why does that king go and kill all those people in the middle of that parable? And you come to that, well, why? why? Why is this happening? OK, well, why in the parable of the sheep and the goats? Can you go, why did Jesus say like this? This is surely like salvation by works, isn't it? Um, but the whole point of the parables was to raise questions in that way. I don't have time for it now. Matthew 13, 10 to 13, Jesus very clearly answers the disciples' question. Why do you speak in parables like this? And his, his point really is, look, I understand that people are resistant to what I'm going to say. So I have to find another way to communicate that, that will alienate some people, but it will show their heart. And for some, it will lead them into a conversation. It will entice them in to know more. Raising questions to start a conversation, not, Jesus' intention was not to download the whole gospel into people's brains without them knowing. And that's generally how the best artistic practice uh, works. So let's conclude. I think our time time is up, but I want to conclude by one with one closing point, which is kind of some application, uh, which is we talked about why uh, should uh, Christians or churches care about the arts? We've done the arts. Let's do the bit in the middle to finish. Care about. How should we apply this then? What does it mean to care about the arts? Uh, what does it mean to, to value artists? Uh, is it do you? Do we uh, tolerate artists? Is that the, the outcome? Do we do we publicly praise artists? Do we uh, um, give artists a bit of a break uh, and, and for some of their quirks and things like that? Is that what we, we mean by this sort of stuff? Well, uh, in a sense, yes, I would agree with all that stuff, but I want to be a little more concrete and potentially provocative as we finish. What does it mean by care about the arts? What should we do? I think very practically it means we as churches need to give artists money. I think that would be where I'd be landing uh, here. Now you might think, well, oh, here we go, pass the collection plate round. Uh, <laughs> then how you do that on the computer? I, the guys have got a way to do that. Fantastic, brilliant. Um, but but so I just want to spend a couple of minutes just to finish, just showing why I think that's especially important with artists and the arts. Okay. 
in most professions or disciplines, if you're good at what you do, you get paid directly from what you do. OK, I, I think we'd all understand that sort of principle. And what the flip side of that would be, if someone doesn't get paid for what they do, you would assume they're not very good at it. They should find something they're better at. OK, that's usually how things work or how people think. OK, and uh, I came into working with artists uh, through Sputnik with a similar mentality. And so what would happen was I'd find these artists out there, Christian artists, who are making work of obviously a high quality that's highly respected in their field and highly respected widely as well. And so I thought, well, therefore, they must be being paid for that specific work. And what I find time after time again, and I keep finding this, is that's almost never the case. The, the artists that are making interesting, engaging, powerfully communicated work usually are not getting paid for that work. In fact, they are subsidising that work from their own pockets. And to do so, uh, they are doing much more mundane jobs and they're finding that they have to be very creative in finding work. But the work they're finding is probably not very creative in that sort of way. OK. And because of this strange quirk of the arts, um, since the Middle Ages, the arts have been kept going by a system of what's called arts patronage, OK, where basically individuals or organisations support artists financially to allow them to keep freely producing uh, their work. And in the Middle Ages, the, 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 the famous time of arts patronage, there was one organisation above all others that was at the forefront of arts patronage, and that was the Christian church, in Europe anyway. The Christian church uh, was the main patron of the arts okay what was the result of that well you could look at it either way I mean these things all go together because Europe was very Christian in those days but in a sense the result of that was the uh, art of that period was very Christian in tone and content as well and that was the painting as well as the architecture and the music as well okay let's fast forward to today then Today, arts patronage is, is still alive and well, but the key players have changed slightly. The key arts patrons, there are lots of individual arts patrons, very rich, uh, but generally the big organisation is the government. OK, the government that operates on secular humanist principles. Generally, I'm not making a comment uh, about what I think of the government. I'm not being an anarchist. I'm just saying that's how the government in our uh, country seems to work. And so therefore, what kind of art is in the ascendancy in our day and age? Well, funny this, uh, art is secular humanist, OK? To the point, J James Elkins, the professor of art history at the Chicago Institute of Art, put it quite bluntly in 2004 when he wrote this. Contemporary art is as far from organised religion as Western art has ever been, and that might be its most singular achievement. Do you get it? If you pay for art, that art is likely to reflect your values, OK? I think that might sound basic, but I think that's incredibly profound. Christians have been very, very good at pointing out, in my lifetime anyway, that the art that's been made over the last century has not been particularly in line with Christian values. Okay, We've been really vocal on that stuff. Okay, We've been very poor at funding art that will speak into culture. We, we do fund art. We've quite a lot of money into the arts. Arts that speak directly to Christians. That, that's how we do it. Um, but those aren't the people that we mainly need to communicate with. And I think that art has a power that goes beyond that. If we want to see the type of art that is being created change to more powerfully communicate across the gulf, if I can put it like that, I suggest we should think very carefully as individuals and as churches about how we can understand, appreciate, but also financially support Christians making art who are in and around our churches. So why should Christians or churches care about the arts? I've done my best to, to quickly rush through. I'm going to hand back to Hannah. Uh, and some questions may be forthcoming, uh, which I'll be happy to answer for you in the next half an hour. Hooray! Right, hello. I am back in the, the hot seat as well, sharing it with you. Um, fantastic. OK, so we have had questions come on in, which is brilliant. We love it. Um, so let's kick straight off. Obviously, I come in order of um, trying to get them in order of how they've kind of come in. So let's start with uh, this one then. Um, how do you encourage and release people to be creative and also bring a balance of cultural relevance, helping your artists to create in a way that connects with the unchurched that are coming into church? Um, you went a bit robotic halfway through for my my uh, thing. Fine. Isn't a comment on your voice, Hannah? So the question is, how I'll do we again. raise artists? Okay, yeah, please, that would be great. Yeah. How do you encourage and release people 
to be creative and also bring a balance of cultural relevance, helping your artists create in a way that connects with the unchurched that are coming into church? Yeah, um, good, really good question. Um, but I, I look, I, I think, look back broader on the question. I, I think when we say we want to encourage people to be more creative, I want to hone down what we what we mean by that. I mean, as I said, I think I think it's great to be creative. It's really good. And everyone would agree with that. And it's great to be more creative in some ways. To be honest, sometimes it's great to be less creative in, in some ways because creative people, and I speak as someone who I think is a bit creative, we are a bit of a pain sometimes and we probably need to, <laughs> to rein it in, you know. But, um, my, my question more would be, how do we encourage people towards artistic excellence in being able to communicate powerfully in artistic genres? And I think whether that's people... I think we could think if we think too directly just about those coming into our church services, I don't think that serves us uh, a complete uh, or at least at the moment, the way church is set. I think that's we've got a number of other steps to go through. My encouragement would always be for someone learn your craft. Um, it would be if someone's interested in and they might be just interested in creativity, just have a creative spark, just want to, uh, it might be a young person, might be someone a little older, but just is very interested in a creative thing, poetry or something like that. I'd say, right, we'll get good at what you're doing. Um, and I'd say the key things would be, as I've said, um, do it lots, learn from the masters in your discipline who won't be Christians uh, on the whole. Um, and that is pastorally tricky because you, some, some, disciplines obviously they have every discipline we have some things that are good some things that aren't so good and so we have to navigate that and we have to work work yeah. that through but i would encourage people to excellence in that sense now in the church i think the question was people who come into our churches i don't think we should put a burden of expectation of artistic excellence on our church services in that way i think our creative output in churches even our church meetings operates differently to how creative output does in the world in the it, just give a couple of examples creative output in a church service needs to be clear it needs to people need to understand what you're doing pretty immediately if i if someone brings a prophetic picture or a prophetic dance it's no good just to do your dance your picture which is completely ambiguous and say god's spoken i mean no one knows what you're talking about um and so we explain and and that's important in a communal context and so um, also as regards quality of work I think if we set too much of a high bar on quality within the church meeting, we will stunt people's creative contributions, which I, I don't, I, I like the way you can have people sing out with different, whose voices are not perfect in meetings, in our kind of church we do that. Um, and so, but I'm saying, so different rules apply in each work, world. And I think for me, I like to keep them separate. And that's why we as funny, we work with artists who are doing stuff in the, outside the church, but obviously, we're Christians in churches where we serve our church, so we bring that stuff back in. I prefer to see the model up to now has been do lots of creative stuff in church meetings. And the expectation has been that will probably spill over one point. You will go and take over the world and revival will break out because everyone out there, you're brilliant in church, so you'll be brilliant out there. It just, as far as I'm concerned, it just doesn't work in that way. I prefer to reset it, encourage our artists to be excellent in the world, learn the skills out there, and then the overspill would be we would see more creative excellence in our churches. Okay, okay, that's really helpful. Um, oh gosh, right, what next? So um, let's go with this one then, um, which is probably linked to that, but just it, in case we haven't covered this. Um, do you have tips for handling artists um who want to bring their that's how it was written honestly um who want to bring their work into gathered worship settings where either a the standard of art is poor or b it's just not a good fit for that context so people that are really keen but obviously you've got that tricky dilemma it doesn't either yeah. fit or you perceive actually it's not yeah right yeah then. Again, I'm happy this comes up and please keep peppering these questions, but I'm going to be pushing back on these all the time in that I think I really value our gathered community, gathered meetings. I think they're really important um, when we meet with God and, and all that stuff. Um, however, the danger is that for validation in all sorts of ways, we need to be in the meeting. So I'm only valid if someone mentions me in the meeting or my, my skills only valid if it can be used in the church service. I think we really need to be careful of that. And for an artist, what I'd say is I'd encourage artists, please do not expect the church to valid. To, if you want validation as artists, please don't expect your church to do it for you. You need to find that elsewhere. 
um, because it's too much of a burden to place on your church leaders. And in a sense, the, the artwork and the creativity that's going to be on display in a gathered meeting with, with 200 people from all sorts of different cultures and classes and all sorts is going to be lowest common denominator to be effective. Because basically, you want to not wind anyone up. That's one of your, your key goals <laughs> in what you're doing, which doesn't produce the kind of art that powerfully communicates. I, I, I don't think, I think art must have an edge to it. It must have a, a level of ambiguity, but also potential shock, because those things just become very bland. Um, and I think some people are very critical of say, contemporary worship music or things like that. I just think that's what, in a gathered thing, we, we have to go to the lowest common denominator in some sense. I don't mean that, you know, I don't think it's good. I just think that's what it does. And so I'd say to an artist, look, don't find validation there. And for us, as in our organisation, Sputnik, what we're trying to do is, is help church by saying, look, we can help these guys and we want to give them affirmation in what they're doing. doing. And if they're just creative, got a creative spot, we want to encourage them, get good at what you're doing, get excellent at what you're doing. We'll help you. We'll introduce you to other guys and, and other girls and, and stuff like that. And, and we'll profile your work as well. Um, I think... The, the only thing I'd say for church, I think the key thing is church leads, it's really helpful to affirm artists. Now, this wouldn't be just someone who's got a creative itch and would like to share it in a church meeting. But if someone in your church is really good at what they do, it's very important to be sharing that on, on Twitter and things like that. So guys in our, our church um, who would have recently, they, they got a really great headline uh, support app um, slot at the Birmingham 2 Academy with a Scandinavian pop act who I've never heard of before, but they've got like 10 million monthly listeners on Spotify, so some people obviously like them. Um, and so we as a church, it's just simple things. We put it on our Facebook and our Twitter, pray for these guys, they're doing this this week. Uh, what I've noticed is churches will do that for the new worship album they, they produce um, or or, so, or if someone brings a creative contribution that's really good, sometimes they even video it, put it up, but they are completely silent on guys who are actually doing a really hard thing and who a lot of the time feel that the church just doesn't care and doesn't understand them. And I think that's a way churches can affirm others. Apart from that, I'd cheekily say, contact Sputnik, send them to us. <laughs> we'll, we'll help them. <laughs> but first plug, it won't be the last. <laughs> good plug. Um, now it's interesting. Because you, like you say, your words, you're pushing back on some of the stuff in church context. Um, but obviously we've got some more questions, because what about the whole role of that as um, a form of prophetic stuff? So, um, you know, rather than validation, but it being used as a prophetic gift in the church. Just can yeah. you comment on that? Really good. Last time I was on broadcast, I was asked this question. I didn't, I, I was too me by surprise. I didn't. Uh... I didn't have a frame of reference. So I spent the last two years trying to get my handle on this. So I've probably bigged up my answers too much. I should have said that at the end, shouldn't I? Um, again, I, I'd want to push back on, on, on this as well. I think when we talk about pro the prophetic in our meetings, the model we have for prophets uh, in the Bible, we, we, obviously the Old Testament and the New Testament, they're prophets in both Testaments, but they are different. There's a different tone to them. And I mean, I, I think you probably have training on this, as I'm sure this broadcast and stuff a lot of stuff about this however i think what we often do is we say well the new testament prop gives property is very different to the old testament it's superseded it and we forget the lessons in the old testament that we have a significant body of prophetic material there and i'd say when we talk about the prophetic i think sometimes we, what we mean is uh, how to encourage and comfort and strengthen the body um and I think, obviously, vitally important. I think, just like I said, in a church meeting, that's what we need to do. All our art is doing that, as well as all our contributions. We want to strengthen, we want to bring together, we want to do all of those things. Interestingly, in the prophetic context in the Old Testament is it provides a critique of, of things, as well as bringing hope. Within the Christian, within the, well, the people of God, within the community, um, it, it, there'd be a strong element of critique. So you'd have um, these kind of companies of prophets within... Uh, uh, the people of Israel, the, the kind of the, the professional prophets, and they're all saying, hey, go to war, you'll be successful to, to whichever king it might be. But then the, the actual real prophet comes and says, no, you lot, there's a, you're going to die in the battle or something. And there's a critique of what's, what's going on. Interesting, those prophets in the Old Testament, I think definitely Ezekiel, partly Jeremiah and also Isaiah, I think they are artists. They, they, they are, they're almost like 1960s conceptual performance artists 3,000 years before their time. And I think I, I, we, we put a series on the Sputnik blog, What is Prophetic Art? And I think that there's something we need to recapture about the 
Old Testament prophets or a critique. Now, for me, I think it's mainly into culture where I'm at. So I'm encouraging artists. I want you to be a prophetic voice. Um, and do that through your art into culture. Comment on what's going on. Look at the trends that are going on. So I, I, I haven't read Amos or Joel, or I should really remember what this was. The one about the locusts. It was probably Joel. Uh, this locust swarm, uh, and he 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 talks about that in the context. And he he brings out figuratively. There's an actual locust locust swarm happens in, in in the Old Testament, and he figuratively brings out what does this mean? What's God saying to this? And in, in Birmingham at that time, we were having a a bin strike. No one was collecting our bins. I started reading. I thought, wait a minute. Things that are happening. What do they mean? And so I wrote a piece called uh, "Black Bags," I think it was called. Just trying to think, get under the surface a little bit, like, and just trying. Well, this is what the Old Testament prophets uh, seem to do. And I, I didn't. I, it was funny. I did it in church, but I added an extra verse, which was really kind of explaining what was going on because the rest of it was a little bit, <laughs> a bit difficult, maybe. Um, and then I put one on the website, which is more to to uh, to uh, the world. And I said that's prophetic. Uh, um, in in a sense, and, and I think as artists we have a special call. Artists have a special call to prophes uh, to prophesy in that way. I think in a church context, again, we just what are we trying to do? If, if someone wants to make a name for themselves or do something avant garde, I just I'm not sure personally as a church leader. I, I don't think the church meeting usually is the place for sort of avant garde work. The least people scratching their head or half the people shaking their fist at you. But we need to find a way for people to be able to do that because that is prophetic in that way. I think the only interesting thing we haven't explored much, I'd love to see a day where those artists, those prophetic artists come back into the church and prophets start questioning our culture, not just endorsing the things we want to do. Now, I don't I don't mean that as I, I, I love, I'm blessed massively by the prophetic, by people in church being uh, giving words and stuff. But I just as a provocation off topic. Um, Sometimes our churches can be a little like the gatherings of prophets in the Old Testament, where everyone's just saying, "Yes, keep doing what you're doing. You're great." In lots of different ways. Sometimes I think we could do with a Jeremiah coming in and shaking things up and saying, "Are wearing a wooden wooden yoke around his neck and going, no, this is God needs to redirect you.'" If we can have people like that, I think we can hear God in whole new ways. Uh, we'd have to be quite robust for that. So, uh, yeah. So sorry to keep pushing back. So I'm not giving the answers you you want to give. I, I just think we need to think this this through really. Yeah, no, it's brilliant because obviously if people are uh, listening to your answers and going, but I've got this question, honestly, um, they are more than welcome to just keep typing and I'll just keep bringing them yeah. up. So Fire away, bring it on. Bring, bring it on in uh, 11 minutes. Uh, so, <laughs> um, going <laughs> right back then, at the beginning, where you talked about entering into an artistic tradition. Yes. When you're doing that, you're entering an artistic tradition that isn't built with Christian roots. What yeah. are some of the ways we can hold to the good without getting caught up in things that are less helpful? Great question. Fantastic question. Really good. Um, I think it's important to learn, notice that, that that is the case, that there will be things of, of risk. I think it's also important. I, I think the culture I was brought up in in church was very black and white. Everything in Christian culture was good. Everything outside of Christian culture was bad. So when I was eight yeah. years old in school, we had a lesson on pop music and I made the innocent comment. I thought it was innocent. I thought everyone would agree with me. Of course, pop music is from the devil, though, isn't it? And the entire class and teacher turned on me <laughs> in a way I never knew in my education before or since. Um, and so that was the world I, I grew up in. And I, I think for, for me, it was the bad things were always brought out of, of rap, of heavy metal, of jazz, even of, of films, of this and that. The bad things were always brought through. I think if we're very much on that end, we need to recognise, though, that uh, within human cultures of all sorts, there's always the good and the bad mixed together because we're, we're all made in God's image and we're all broken uh, in, in that sort of sense. And, and I would say that's true in Christian culture, too. And when you look at the Christian contemporary arts scenes that I was brought up on, looking now at some of the arts and what they were up to at those times, I think there's a cautionary tale there because some of those guys were not living the spotless lives you thought they were doing. And actually the messages in some of the music is actually that helpful, um, which is an aside. Um, but so uh, where were we? We were talking about kind of... Uh, Avoiding culture. getting caught, caught yes. up in so, the, yeah, so I, the less helpful. Sorry, yeah. so, so I think that's important to see there's a mix. I think this is really hard. I think though, um, again, another thing I, I say is we can be more sensitive to this with arts than we are in other areas. So if someone says in, in your church, they say, I want to become an actor, say, which would be a, 
in many senses, I mean, as a non-actor, although I very much appreciate it and know lots of actors and would really try to push them forward, it's a hazardous profession. I mean, there's lots of ethical dilemmas for those guys. And we'd, we'd often be, bro, alarm bells ringing. I wonder if someone comes in and says, I'm going to become a banker, for example, whether we'd be more like ching ching church coffers <laughs> or we're more safe with things like that. That. And actually, a banker has got, a, I think it's very important, we have more Christian bankers, but the ethical decisions being made there are surely the similar. When I, when I was a teacher, um, ethical decisions being thrown at me left, right and centre. So with all that said, how do we do it then? Yeah. I think we need to be very wise, <laughs> which is an incredible cop out. But I think we should help people as they do. We shouldn't put people off. Um, so you just can't be involved. But we also need to know them and people need to know their weaknesses in that. So for it, for me, I, I talk practically, rap, I love rap, okay, I love hip hop, uh, and I would advise people to get into it. I think it's, it's important culturally that you know hip hop because it's the most popular music uh, in the world in, in many ways. But for me, if I've got a temptation with, uh, if I'm swearing lots, it would be worth me avoiding music that has swearing lots in. It might be I can come back to it if I've nailed that years to come, but just wise in that way as regards kind of where I'm at um this might sound silly but but the lust for example uh a lust is an issue for everybody but at different points of life it's different so do I am I able to watch certain tv shows even if they're by the masters in their craft and uh, if I'm getting very angry I've got a problem with angry anger should I be listening to Rage Against the Machine all the time okay and, and there's been times in my life where I've had to move through those things I think there's often a balance uh, to be found there as well. And so I'd be thinking balance. I'd be thinking it's not a black and white. It's more of a gray area that we navigate. And I would say this as well. I think I've known the voice of the Holy Spirit more yeah. as I've tried to navigate through art forms in the world than I have in any other way. And so I would say I was taught at an early age. Uh, I stand by this is when you go to buy a piece of art album, ask Jesus before, is this okay? Is this good? And listen, Holy Spirit, what do you say? And noticing the little feeling in your stomach when you're watching the TV show. Now, sometimes actually there's a discomfort that comes from good art that's helpful for us. It's discomforting. And we, we but you need to navigate, we need to learn. This is how we learn to listen to, to God and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I've been hugely blessed from breaking pieces of vinyl over my knee and burning dvd i never burnt one actually i've broken them though but like that and then coming back and saying even some stuff i didn't listen to then now i can listen to it again but this is but we need to be able to engage with this stuff art is not more dangerous than going to work and talking with non-christians if we're going to follow that yeah. we're just going to hide away from everything and I, I think he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world we're, we're wise we should be very wise and careful in that but we've got to go out there god sorry i'm getting on a server now God saw human culture for what it was, and it was rotten, rotten to the core. What did he do? He came into human culture. He he came right in. He went as deep into it as he could have done. He he got he got his hands dirty, and I think as his people, we're commissioned to do exactly the same thing without fear, with wisdom, but to go for it. Would be my taste, and we should encourage them to do that. Brilliant yeah brilliant answer to that one hope that's um whoever asked that i hope that's really helpful i think that's really comprehensive so just looking at the clock and so we'll just make these answers just a little bit quicker just so we get a couple of oh, things in before we finish um when we're pastoring artists this is from a church leader's perspective how oh, much God, background God. knowledge does the pastor need to gain of the tradition the artist is working in excellent question i think being quick i think there is a responsibility on uh, us as pastors uh, as a pastor myself to be aware of culture um, and what's going on i think it's very important that we're appreciating art ourselves i'd, I'd encourage every pastor to, to go and visit your local art gallery with you regularly to be listening to the music that people in your church are listening to out, the ones who are listening to music outside of the church watching the movies not just watching the movies you want to watch what what are the movies that are winning oscars what are the movies that that are getting really good reviews on metacritic.com that's a really good website as regards well as it compiles critics uh, opinions we, we need to i think we need to be in those conversations are we reading if we're just reading christian commentaries all the time 
we're cutting ourselves off from people it, it would be helpful to us to read are we what books have we read recently if if the last five books you read have all been christian non-fiction i'd really want to encourage you and say well where's the literature that you're reading the stories of our age what are we engaging with and I, i'd say that's important generally and i know that past we need to do everything yeah. i'm not trying to give an extra thing but i think it's important generally i think on the other side <laughs> plug number two i think organizations like sputnik are here to help with that you don't need to know everything please don't take the pressure on for this stuff but please go to the right people and i'd encourage you to find people you can trust who you can almost say that like, i trust this person i'm going to push this person towards that person i don't need to do all this myself yeah. but while an awareness to stop you making blunders <laughs> which i have not yeah. so i'm not talking about you guys i'm talking about myself so well, that was quite quick yourself, but um, one more. no that's that was no, good that was good now from the from the other perspective we've got the church lead asking we've also got an artist saying how oh, can an artist led church to value and encourage artists especially if the leaders the art as a lesser thing it's from the other side of things i i think again very very quickly to refer about i think we need to make sure we don't put too much burden on our leaders i think our, not every everyone is not going to understand us that they're not going to in that not everyone understands everyone everybody and um i think that's important that we know and we, we lay that down we, we become part of any community of different people which is like the church be a, a prime example we've got to lay down that we've got to try to not get offended easily when people don't get us and people say stupid things that we just think that's incredibly offensive okay um with that said i think it's vital to find christian artistic community um and connect with other artists uh, as well um not in a seditious way of like let's get together against the church leader but in a way communicating with church, oh, i found this organization for example sputnik um and we want to get involved with that or there's other there's other groups out there as well um so i'd say on both sides of things i i know what it's like the, the feeling you, you, someone asks you what are you doing at the moment you say i've just written and recorded this piece and you start talking to them about what you're doing and just their eyes just start glazing over like this is like it could be a challenge it could be a friend and you just think and it happens again and again and again i remember a friend coming to a gig of mine good friend guy from church and he said at the end of the gig i've just get, spent my heart out of this gig he said johnny why do you do this that, that's, that's his response i was like oh this is ah it's hard but it wasn't a problem because i had other friends who i knew no i, I go to them for this um and actually yeah. i love my church leaders but i don't go to them for everything and I, i'd love to talk to you and i'd love to link you up in all seriousness with other artists uh, in different disciplines if possible that's our plan we'd love to be able to link every artist to another christian artist in a different place through a similar thing that can help yeah. each other with this because i think it's really hard yeah Good no question. that's that's really helpful um, and a final question in our last kind of minute um you the question is this what are some of the best things you've seen church leaders do now let's remember some of the stuff you said already which is visit galleries get themselves you know uh, linked to the culture as well as give money and pray um what are the best things you've seen and tweet obviously uh, church leaders do to support artists in their congregation to finish I'll give you a quick answer, which doesn't fully answer your question, but is, 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 a, is a good thing I have. The other week, two weeks ago, I got a phone call from someone I didn't know. And he said, uh, well, he contacted me on an email. I phoned him. He said, thank you for phoning. I'm glad you phoned today because tomorrow we have um, our arts budget meeting as a church. And I said to him, um, pardon, like, what do you mean? Do you mean you've got a small arts group at church that has a small amount of money you give away to things? Or, and I goes, oh, no, no, this is the whole church. In our church, we have an amount of money given away to commission artists to produce work, um, not necessarily primarily to get the work to beautify their building or anything, but to support those artists. That, that, that's the reason. And I'll be honest, I was absolutely blown away. I'd never heard of anything before. He even added, he goes, we're a, you've got to understand, we're a small church. We have no members of staff and no building, which means we have more money to give away, <laughs> which I just thought was fascinating. Now, I think I cannot overstate the importance of of the funding area, which I know sounds very mercenary, but actually I've heard lots of good thumbs up for creativity. Oh, you artists, you're great, we love you. I've heard loads of that stuff. The problem is if it's not grounded somewhere, uh, it's not, it, it doesn't, it sometimes doesn't mean anything, it sounds very hollow. Very quickly, there are other things. Connecting people with other artists is very important. Profiling work is very important. So like I said before, 
tweeting? Is the church leader tweeting? Have you got even a craft fair on the, the, the local thing? Have you got a, a short story in a local newspaper? Is your church communicating that stuff? If, are you, do you have a voice? That, uh, can you even notice? Can you say something at a church, church meeting? So connecting, profiling, funding would be my yeah. my three things i'm sorry if i'm not bang on the question i'm trying to be quick oh no that's brilliant because i sadly in all of this i think we've run out of time i'm really hoping that we've tackled this from um, both coming from an artist point of view look at this this is oh I, that is my question is that upside down this, is that the wrong way around oh no. no it's the right way around to us just cool. read it out for us sputnikmagazine.co.uk um if you'd like to continue this conversation Go to that website. We've got articles and all this sort of stuff, and we can connect you with example uh, Christian artists. Have a chat. We'd this is if you're interested. I'd love to continue talking to you in whatever way. Brilliant, because that was my question. Um, it just remains for me. I think we've come to the end. We've run out of time now. Um, for me, just to say a big thank you to you uh, Johnny for joining us this evening no and a real special thank you to those of you that have tuned in live and been part of the conversation don't forget plug into that website plug into read those blogs and um, get yourself connected so thank you uh, we really love linking live uh, for this um, kind of event and make sure that you do copy the link this podcast as it's on our website send it to your people that are leading churches that uh, you inspired and caught up in this send this share this with fellow artists so they too can benefit from the things that have been said tonight and also that link there that johnny's just given at the end so do check out the broadcast network website for further posts coming up this month and sign up to be on our mailing list if this is the sort of thing you love to learn and be part of for those of you are, who are at at the Catalyst Festival, please do come and feel free to say hi at the Go Zone where I'll be hanging out or on site when you see any of us from the team around or indeed Johnny. We always love to connect in person with people and uh, and get in a conversation face to face. Uh, but actually that's run out of time. So tonight have a fabulous evening and um, until next time, good night.